Munoz. I'm with ABV. I'm technical manager and uh, operations manager in the Transformer Service in Canada. And the topic I'll be presenting is um, transformer condition assessment uh, for, for fleets. So I'll be going through the, uh, the whole methodology that, uh, that is used and uh, give some examples. This is a, kind of a typical situation for uh, utilities today. Um, a lot of the, uh, the assets are, are greater than 30 years old. Uh, you know, the majority of transformers were installed in the, uh, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so, you know, those assets are becoming, you know, 30, 40 years old. And, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not practical to replace all those transformers, or even maybe even a small amount of them. So it, life extension is, uh, is, is the thing that's going to be done. And usually, um, like most units are having uh, testing done maybe every three or four years, uh, oil DGA is being done every year. Now, maintenance, um, some facilities have a lot of maintenance done, some facilities have less maintenance. Um, if you look across the, uh, the different assets uh, in, in a utility base, uh, some of them are, are heavily loaded, some are lightly loaded, and some are, are more important. And what I mean by that is um, some of them might have a spare unit easily accessible, or some of them, if, if they fail, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. Other ones, if they fail, then uh, it has a huge disruption for customers. So th this is very important to know when, uh, when you're doing a condition assessment. And uh, the, the viability of spare transformers, that is not always known. Um, it's possible you could have a spare transformer that's sitting there for 20, 30 years, you know, uh, never been used, and you really, uh, you really don't know until you put it in service uh, how good it is or if it is going to be a dependable transformer. We find, too, a lot of times the, uh, the short circuit power has changed from when a transformer was originally installed to when it's uh, presently today, you know, just changes in the grid or changes in the, um, in the way the network has been set up. Uh, knowledge of the assets could be reduced. Um, what, could, what often happens is, uh, you know, there's uh, somebody who was there when the assets were installed, perhaps was there for 30 years of, you know, the majority of their career, and then they move on. And then, then you know, then there's new people there, and, uh, you know, they're not familiar with the assets or familiar with all the things that happened with those tra transformers. Uh, failures may not always be understood. Um, you know, transformers fail, maybe there's investigation, but it's not always truly understood what, what happened with them. And, uh, you know, for sure there's limited capital expenditure. I mean, we don't live in an unlimited world, so whatever, whatever money is spent has to be spent well. And high, rel high reliability has to be maintained. And, and the one thing we always say is the, the oldest units are not an, always necessarily the highest risk. And, uh, and I'll, I'll go through and show why that is. So, of course, the, the whole idea, though, is to make the, uh, the best use of the, uh, the capital you have and, uh, and to the assets that you have. So the, uh, doing a fleet assessment, we see that as, a, as a giving you a game plan, uh, giving you something that you can go forth and, uh, and then use your capital and uh, use your resources to the best. So what it is, it's a, it's a consistent um, technical methodology you know, for looking at all the transformers and individually calculating the risk of failure of each one of them and then overall a risk of failure. And the things that it takes into account is uh, you know, the condition of the transformer, all the, uh, the design features of, of the transformer, uh, and also the design features compared to the sister units that, that are known. The, you know, the loading, the maintenance, and the operating environment, and, uh, and the reclosing practice. So this is always done by a, a design engineer. So it's a design engineer that knows the design, not just of generally, but knows the design of those particular vintages of transformers. So from that, we, uh, we develop a risk of failure for each unit. And then uh, the risk of failure that, that we calculate is calibrated to actual risk of failure. So this is risk of failure that we've seen you know, across the industry or in for particular fleets and that. So it's all been calibrated so that it's, it's a realistic number. And then we also uh, calculate a, an importance factor for each unit, and I'll, I'll get more into that. And then you do an overall comparison of all the units. And then, you know, and then from all that, then you can determine what is the right maintenance and uh, what upgrades can be done to, you know, to reduce the risk of failure. I guess the, the overall um, way that, that risk of failure is done, it's kind of uh, three points the way you do it. So the first thing is you calculate you know, what, what it started out with. So that's the design or the strength of a particular attribute. I mean, it is what it is, so we calculate what that is. And then, then you look at what the environment it's operated in through its life. And then you look at the present condition it's at now. So the, the function of those three things gives you the, uh, the risk of failure, and I'll, I'll describe that in, uh, in more detail. Now just to uh, back up how, uh, how transformers fail, one of, the, um, one of the main reasons transformers fail is because of an accessory. This could be a bushing or a tap changer. 
Uh, another uh, often way it fails is a short circuit failure. So there's some kind of fault on the system. And uh, that, that comes back to the transformer, cause a mechanical uh, stress in the transformer, and then fails it that way. Uh, dielectric failure, if there's some kind of uh, over-voltage or transient voltage on the system. And again, that comes back to the transformer, and it's more than the transformer can sustain. You could have a thermal failure. Now, generally, uh, thermal is something that happens you know, over time, and it doesn't necessarily uh, fail a transformer, but it becomes to a point where the transformer has to be removed from service because it's gassing so much, or the... Uh, the cellulose has reached its end of its life. And then there's other kind of events that um, you know, are more regional, or, uh, such as uh, you know, earthquake, seismic, or uh, GIC. So I'm going to go through uh, all of these. So, so the overall idea <clears throat> is, um, I mean, you want to calculate a risk of failure for a transformer. And you have like all these you know, different input data, like all the different you know, DGA and um, test results, information you know about transformers and so on. And uh, each of these you know, contribute in some way to all the different risk categories of a, of a risk of failure assessment. So of course, it's how, how it applies to each factor and what rules you use. That's, you know, that's the backbone of a risk of failure calculation. But the, the end goal is to get one number, like some percent risk of failure per year for a transformer. This is a distribution of a risk of failure. So you have risk of failure here and the, uh, the number of units. Uh, a normal risk of failure is about 1% for a fleet. So if it's higher than 1% per year, we, we consider that uh, you know, higher than normal. And we usually uh, we generate uh, a chart something like this, so showing a risk of failure here and then the relative importance here. Now, the, the idea here is that, I mean, say you have a transformer that, say, let's look at this one, has a high risk of failure, but it's not that important, meaning maybe, it's, maybe it has a double. There's two of them together, so if one fails, the other one right beside it can handle the whole load. Or maybe if it fails, it's very easy to divert load, you know, something like that. Versus one that maybe it has a lower risk of failure, but it is, if it fails, it's so disruptive to the system or to the customer that, um, that you know, that one has, to, uh, has, has a much higher, uh, uh, needs to have a much higher reliability than another transformer. So that, that's important when, when you're comparing uh, two transformers. And of course, uh, red, yellow, green, I mean, that's uh, simple to understand. I mean, the red ones are ones that really something has to be done uh, very soon. Yellow, you know, maybe you have a longer time. And then the green units, uh, they're, they're fine the way they are. OK, so now I'm, I'm going to go through all the different uh, risk categories for uh, risk of failure assessment. OK, so again, we have the mechanical, thermal, and dielectric. So the, the mechanical is, uh, has to do with the, uh, the forces um, in the windings. Uh, this is caused by overcurrent, fault current. It could also be caused by inrush current, uh, by having many inrush currents. And then thermal stress you know, is due to overheating of the windings or uh, overheating of uh, metal parts in the transformer. And that could be you know, due to long time loading, or it could be due to something wrong with the cooling, uh, or uh, it, it could be that was just the way it was, it was uh, designed and built. And then you have uh, dielectric stresses. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, some kind of overvoltage, such as lightning. You could have uh, switching transients. So. so I'll go through the background of all of these. OK, so uh, mechanical risk of failure. So usually, uh, like a short circuit failure is caused by some kind of through fault. So this can be some kind of line to ground fault or a line to line fault, and then uh, coming back to the transformer. And when, when this happens, the only thing that limits it is the transformer impedance. So so a transformer that has lower impedance you know, has, a, has to sustain a much higher mechanical forces than a high impedance transformer. And uh, this, this force that it sees, it, it can be, uh, or sorry, the, the short circuit current can be many times the, uh, the normal rated current. Okay, and then this um, full current, I mean, so as I said, it's limited by the impedance. It also matters um, what was the, uh, the voltage at the time and then the uh, instant in the fault of where the, uh, the cycle then it hit. So the, the end result of all this is that you have uh, a much more magnetic flux in the transformer. And this causes uh, all huge me me mechanical forces in the transformer. So this is a, um, a flux plot of a transformer. So um, what ha when, you have a, a, when you have a short circuit event, what happens is you have all this extra flux. And what it wants to do is it wants to drive the windings out, the, in the inner one in and the outer one out. And then it wants to have it grow, uh, grow actually. And uh, so it, it actually matters. So it makes a big difference which winding you're looking at, which, which kind of forces it has to sustain. But you can just imagine um, the, the clamping of the windings, how the windings are made uh, is, is very important. 
And it's also a very important that the, the center of the windings are, are very close to each other. Because if there is a big difference in the center of the windings, when you have a short circuit event, it's going to try to drive that, that apart. So actually, when we make transformers, the, uh, the center of the windings have to be within a few millimeters tolerance. If it's not, then uh, during a short circuit event, it's, it's really going to uh, exaggerate that difference. Okay, so as I said, for, for inner winding, it's trying to, trying to compress it inward. Outer winding, it's trying to compress it outward. Uh, this is uh, kind of what uh, you can see a buckling. And, and so you can have a, a buckling also, or you can have a, it's kind of an unspiraling of, of the transformer winding. And I have some pictures here. Perhaps you've seen this before. This is a typical short circuit uh, failure. It's actually not necessarily a failure. This, this could happen, and the transformer could live like this for many years, and then uh, could be even be just a small dielectric event that fails it. But uh, it's uh, not unusual to take apart a transformer and find some kind of uh, buckling like this in the windings. So they, during a short circuit event, so what can happen is the, um, yeah, the winding end support, that can fail. So this is, uh, these are huge uh, blocks that, uh, that hold the, uh, the windings together and that are clamped against the, uh, the clamps. You could have the tilting of the conductors, the, uh, the winding can telescope. Uh, the cables between spacers, they can bend, and you can have uh, damage on the conductor insulation. And as I said, uh, a, a transformer could survive this, and it could be something else later that, that fails at some kind of dielectric event. So, so this is uh, where it's trying to become much bigger. These are the types of failures you can have. So usually what, uh, what, what will frequently happen is um, the, the integrity at the end of the windings will, uh, will be compromised, and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get lots of damage at the end of the windings, and then uh, if, if it's enough, then the, the winding will just come right apart. So when we look at the uh, short, uh, sorry, short circuit failure, so we first look at the, uh, the, the transformer design. So this is the strength of the winding, so the strength of what it can take. So normally what we look at, if, if it was designed after 1990, after 1990, the, you know, the computers became so much better and is, is able to be designed with a, with a 3D finite element tool. And if it was designed with that, I mean, normally the short circuit forces are taken care of. So normally if it was designed before 1990, then it was more designed with, uh, with hand rules and... Uh, and uh, paper calculations. So for those, it's, um, it's, it's normally, uh, the, the transformers normally cannot uh, take the present day short circuit forces. So that's, that's one of the first things we look at. Then we also look at the, uh, the hardness of the copper that was used. Um, today you can get uh, very hard copper. So the harder the copper, the much more uh, short circuit it can take. Also if it was a uh, transposed cable or if it was a uh, rectangular cable. And then the, uh, the cellulose that's used in the transformer, if it was uh, low density or high density, present day is high density, so it has uh, much, uh, much better, uh, uh, can take the short circuit forces much better. And then also the, uh, the precision in the manufacturing. As I was talking about the centers not being offset, what were the, uh, the tolerances on the diameters and the clamping forces, or sorry, the clamping process? And then the, uh, the type of blocking at the ends. Um, so normally when a transformer is made, uh, it goes through the vapor phase process. It dries a lot, so it actually can shrink, you know, you know even a, a, almost an inch actually can shrink. So then after it's done, then you go back uh, inside the transformer for uh, briefly, and then you reclamp the windings, using, usually using jacks, and then you put uh, blocks in to hold it in place. Now, I mean, uh, use, in the past they would use um, low-density press board, and then uh, over the time, you know, that would, uh, that would become loose. So that's one type of blocking we, uh, we look for, and we, uh, well, we don't like that. And then uh, if, if it was used high-density press board, that was better. Um, there's uh, some designs where they had uh, what they call dash pots. So it's almost like a, a spring that, that, that follows the windings. So, and this keeps the, uh, the pressure on the windings. So that, that was a very good, uh, very good clamping process. So these are the type of things that are taken into account when you're looking at the transformer design. You look at the, also the uh, dielectric and thermal condition of the windings. So uh, windings that have um, aged a lot, uh, meaning like the cellulose has, uh, has aged and reached the end of its life, it's going to be much more susceptible to, uh, to a short circuit failure than one that you know, has uh, paper that's not very aged. And then also the reclosing practice. So this means um, when, when there is a fault, like uh, is there automatic reclosing or is, you know, what is the reclosing practice? So. And then also the, uh, the average number of through faults per year experienced by a transformer. Uh, there's, you know, depending where a transformer is in, in the grid, it can see um, less or more uh, through faults, or also the, uh, the, you know, the size of the through faults as well. 
I mean, there's some transformers by nature see a lot of through faults, uh, like say uh, industrial transformers, but they're they're usually designed a little bit differently for uh, to sustain short circuit forces much more. But but all these things uh, go into account when you're calculating the uh, the risk of short circuit failure. Okay, so again, um, just going back to what I was saying, where you have uh, you calculate the you know the design or what it was born with. You know, so that's this part, and then the environment that it, that it was in. So that's you know, the number of through faults it saw through its life and this, the amount of through faults. And then what, what is its condition now? So uh, looking at the thermal and the dielectric condition. So all these things you, know, you use to calculate what is the overall risk of failure for the uh, mechanical risk aspect. Okay, so now if we go to the, uh, the thermal risk aspect. So this is more or less you know, the, uh, the condition of the, uh, of the paper. So what we look here is... Um, a lot of it is the DGA is what we look at. And there's kind of um, like three uh, types of, uh, of gassing that you look at. The one is if you have uh, like hot cellulose. So this is where you have just cellulose gassing, so a carbon oxide gassing. And normally you, you actually have normal cellulose aging. And uh, that, you know, that, we don't worry about that so much. Uh, you also have a hot metal gassing. So this is where you have um, some kind of... Um, uh, overheating either in the, in the clamp, core clamping system or in the tank or um, could be in the clamps or something like that. And uh, that too, we don't, we don't worry about that so much either. This is more a, a nuisance gassing than anything. The worst thing though is you have hot cellulose and hot metal. So that, that means that you have uh, some hot spot where there's paper involved and that, that's serious. So this normally you would see uh, like a car, you know, CO, CO2, and this would be uh, more like ethylene, methane. Uh, it could even be acetylene if it's uh, if it's a very uh, hot uh, hot spot. So the the typical things you're looking for are uh, of course the the temperature. So what is the te operating temperature of the transformer? We can calculate that, and then the the age of the transformer insulation, which um, this you can uh, determine uh, from. Well, if you have a paper sample, that's the best, but uh, Another way is to use a Furan's measurement from the, uh, from the oil sample. And then the, the relative composition of the, uh, the produced carbon oxides gas. <clears throat> so we look at usually at the CO, CO2 ratio. If it's a, um, between about a 3 to 10 ratio, that's normal aging. But if it's, if it's higher or lower, that indicates uh, that uh, different, uh, different type of fault is going on. We look at the uh, oxygen and moisture in the oil. <coughs> if you have a, a lot of oxygen, or, or a lot of moisture, of course, then the, uh, the cellulose ages much faster. Uh, this, uh, one thing we talk about a lot is this degree of polymerization. This basically it talks about the, uh, the age of, of cellulose. When, uh, when you start out with new cellulose, you have a, a DP value of about, uh, about 1,100. And then when it gets down to about 200, that's uh, when it's reached the end of its life. And uh, what, what accelerates that aging is, uh, is having uh, high moisture or high, high oxygen. And uh, just to uh, also tell you, like cellulose ages um, at, it, if you had 105 degrees for your cellulose, it can last about you know, 18 to 20 years at that temperature. So by having uh, high uh, moisture, meaning uh, instead of having a half a percent, having uh, one or two percent, sorry, or two or three percent, you know, that, that almost doubles that, uh, that aging rate. And the same with having uh, high oxygen, that, that can uh, double or triple the aging rate. Okay, so then we also look at the, uh, the hydrocarbon gases and then the load profile. The, um, the condition of the cooling equipment is very important, um, especially uh, for coolers, generally coolers, like meaning where you have um, a cooler package instead of a fan radiator package, they can, uh, they can um, degrade over time. So it's very important what is the condition of those. And then uh, look for uh, hot spots in metallic materials, okay, so for the core or the uh, current carrying contacts. So this you can determine from the DJA. You can also be, uh, if you do a design review, you can also see if there is uh, this issue there. But the, the one thing I want to stress is, like, you can do all this, but um, the, the end of life cellulose doesn't necessarily mean that it um, has a high risk of failure. Um, However, if, if it is, as I was saying before, if you have a cellulose that does, has reached the end of its life, it's more susceptible to a dielectric risk of failure. So it's not necessarily that the, the thermal part of it fails it. It's more, it's more susceptible to other things. Okay, so now we'll go to the uh, electrical risk aspect. So what we're looking at here is um, what, what is the strength of the transformer that it can take uh, some kind of over-voltage or a transient voltage. Now, and what I mean by that... Um, 
So an overvoltage, like normally you have an AC, uh, like sinusoidal uh, voltage on a transformer. So an impulse is, is something that, like uh, when a lightning hits a line and then you have uh, that voltage surge goes back to the transformer. And that has a very distinct wave shape. And then also, in, you can also have what you call a switching surge. It's some kind of uh, switching fault. And that has a very, another, a very different uh, wave shape. Transformers uh, over the years, uh, I, I can say in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, as, as there was a lot of uh, failures in transformer fleets, uh, users of transformers uh, began to understand, you know, what was failing these transformers dielectrically. And then the standards were changed so that uh, transformers had to be tested for uh, basically for lightning impulse and for switching surge. And wh what we find today is if, if they are tested for that, if they're designed and tested for that, you know, normally they don't fail in the field that way. So it actually has a lot to do with what a transformer was designed for, you know, if it was designed at a time when it had to be tested for impulse and switching surge. That, that's one big thing to look at. And then also what, what level it was tested at. If in the standards, uh, for example, if you're looking at impulse voltage, like normally there's, you know, three or four um, uh, ranges that it could be designed for. And this is, you know, this is uh, given by the, uh, whoever's buying the transformer. But uh, for example, if they say it's designed for a 650 uh, impulse, and it could have also been designed for 550 or 750 or 850. I mean, that, that's important to know because, uh, and also relative to what, what it is in the, uh, in the grid. Uh, the, the location, um, there's some places in the, in the world that are much more lightning prone. I mean, Florida is, uh, is probably, I think, one of the highest in the world. So uh, being located in Florida, Florida versus, you know, being located in, uh, in a less uh, lightning prone area, this, this has a big difference as well. And then there's uh, the design of the overvoltage protection equipment. Uh, a lot of transformers will have uh, some kind of arresters on it. And uh, actually, if, if generally, if they're modern type uh, arresters like zinc oxide, then the, uh, it, it's virtually protected actually from seeing a lightning impulse then. So knowing what type of arresters are on the transformers uh, is very important to know for uh, calculating a, a risk factor. So then if you want to know the, uh, the condition of the transformer, one of the best measurements is a, is a power factor measurements and capacitance factor of the, uh, of the insulation. So this is a, a measurement you can do, you know, without... You just need to de-energize the transformer, and then you, uh, you can test the transformer and get a power factor of the insulation. And that's a good indication of the, uh, of the condition of the, uh, of the transformer. And then uh, oil quality results. Um, here, generally, you're usually looking for um, hydrogen or uh, acetylene gases, indicating that there's been uh, arcing or partial discharge in the transformer. So that'll give you some indication if there has been some, uh, some event, dielectric event in the transformer. Okay. And uh, just uh, one thing I want to know, uh, wind farms, uh, this, you know, there's a lot of wind farms going up in the last you know, five, 10 years. They, they tend to have a higher dielectric failure rate. And uh, right now, you know, the industry is, um, well, you know, they're, they're starting to understand that and uh, the standards are gonna be changed for that. Uh, I, my, my opinion, I think what's happening with wind farms is that um, they're seeing a, a lot more transients and uh, harmonics than, uh, than they were designed for. They actually almost need to be designed more as an industrial transformer than a, than a regular power transformer. But uh, we, we take that into account when we're, uh, we're looking at risk factors. Then there's uh, accessory risk. So again, uh, a bushing or a tab changer, you know, th these can fail a transformer. You know, it's, it's actually unfortunate when you have uh, an accessory such as a bushing or tab changer fail a transformer because it's actually uh, all of the, you know, all these accessories are, you know, you can do maintenance on them. You can be looking at them to see how they are. And, uh, you know, for example, a bushing, if it fails, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, it, it, um, it, it explodes and then uh, it can put porcelain through the transformer and uh, maybe not even fail the transformer, but because it contaminates the transformer, uh, in, in a lot of cases, it requires the transformer to be rewound just because uh, you don't know where all that contamination went. You know, for a component that, you know, is maybe it's only $10,000, you know, so it's very important to be uh, looking at the condition of bushings and tap changers. Uh, tap changers especially, they require a lot of maintenance, regular maintenance. I mean, it's the only mechanical moving part in a transformer. So, uh, you know, as, as long as maintenance is done and you're, uh, you're looking at them a lot, um, you know, they can last, uh, last for the life of the transformer. And then uh, pumps, um, pumps need to have maintenance done as well. Um, it's actually wise probably to, uh, 
you know, to overhaul them uh, uh, periodically. So, so again, these are these are accessories that, that you know you can do a lot about. And, and if you look at uh, failure statistics in the industry, you know, probably a third of uh, transformer failures are caused by accessories. So when we when we look at um, calculating a risk of failure for accessories, I mean. For uh, tab changers, we, we will look at the type of transfer. Sorry, the type of tab changers. I mean, there's some tab changers that are, um, you know, have uh, certain issues, and um, you know, if those issues aren't taken care of, that that can make it much higher uh, higher risk of failure. There's um, certain diagnosis you can do in tab changers. Uh, for bushings, I mean, the the best thing for bushings is doing regular power factor measurements of bushings. I mean. Usually, you can see a problem in a bushing developing over time. Usually, they don't just uh, you know just come out of nowhere. Usually, they develop over over several years. So, if you see a bushing or sorry a power factor creeping up on a bushing, you know usually you have enough time to take action you know to change out that that bushing. Okay, and then we also look at uh, different you know pump risk factors and other uh, other accessories. Okay, then uh, random risk factors. Okay, so the other things I I was talking about. Um, like a seismic zone. I mean, of course, uh, there's uh, the west coast of, uh, of you know, Canada and the United States has a much more uh, risk of uh, failure due to uh, earthquake. Generally, if, uh, if a transformer is designed for seismic, uh, usually it, it, it will survive an earthquake. So it's more uh, transformers that were designed uh, you know, at a time where uh, there wasn't uh, regulations for, uh, for having it to be designed for seismic. Uh, there's a static electrification. So this is um, uh, a problem that, that came about, in, I guess, in the 80s and the 90s, where the, uh, the velocity of the oil going through the, uh, through the windings could actually uh, cause a dielectric failure. So that, that, that is generally for uh, certain vintages of transformers. Uh, GIC, so this is the um, sunspots. It's actually a timely thing right now, because uh, I think we're entering a period where we, uh, we could be seeing... Uh, high uh, GIC activity, so geometrically induced current activity. So this is where you have a, uh, a high current injected through the neutral of the, uh, the transformer. And uh, basically what it does is it, it raises the, uh, the flux density in the transformer and it saturates and you can get a failure that way. But uh, the GIC is again, it's a regional thing. There are certain regions of, the, of North America that are much more, uh, G, are more susceptible to GIC. And it's also, there are certain types of transformers that are more susceptible to GIC. So that, that can all be, uh, you can calculate a risk factor for all that. And then there's, there's certain types of transformers that, that again, are more, more susceptible to some, have, have some kind of special failures. So that, that's all included in a random risk uh, aspect. Okay, so other things, you know, you look at, like the condition of the, um, of the DGA, and uh, we talked about that a lot, and that, that impacts a lot, you know, it impacts differently the dielectric, the, uh, the short circuit, and the thermal risk factor. The oil quality of a transformer is, is very important. So this is the, um, you know, the acidity in the oil. So that tells you what, what type of sludging uh, has, has been built up over the years in the, uh, in the oil. The uh, interfacial tension is important. Um, the, uh, the dielectric strength of the oil is important. Uh, furans, this is a, uh, as I was saying before, it's, it, it can give you a good measurement of the, uh, the age of the cellulose. And then the, uh, the power factor of the oil. So all these things are, are important in calculating the, the condition of all the different aspects of the risk factors. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, and then you have routine electrical test results. I mean, uh, ratio, winding, uh, power factor I talked about. The uh, insulation resistance. So this is um, putting a, you know, 2 or 5 or 10 kV on the windings and then also looking at what is the, uh, the insulation strength to ground of windings or the, uh, the core to ground. And uh, bushing power factors and excitation tests. Uh, another um, very good tool is uh, thermography. Uh, so this is where uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of utilities use this now. Is where you take uh, a thermal scan of a transformer, and you can you can usually see uh, particular issues. I mean, one of one of the best things to see is um, if there's a uh, if there's a hot hot connection on a bushing. So you hear this is uh, an example where there's somehow there's a loose connection, or, or you know something's not right with this connection to the bushing. Now this, this hot spot in itself is not a big deal, but what can happen is that that heat can go into the bushing and then degrade the bushing uh, over time. There's, uh, I, mean, I personally know of lots of cases where that's happened and it's failed the bushing and then failed the transformer. So th this is a good thing to be looking for, uh, looking for regularly. <clears throat> also with thermography, I mean, uh, you can see if there's a 
problems with the cooling. So here, actually, I mean, you can see this cooling is, is red, and well, this one should be too, but it's not, because uh, for some reason it's blocked or there's, uh, the sh it's been shut off. So I mean, there's, and you can also, like, so often you can see if there's hot spots around the tank and that. So this can, this can be a very good tool for, uh, for seeing if there's any, uh, any issues with the transformer. Okay, so then we, uh, so we calculate all these uh, different individual risk factors, you know, using all the different input data, and then you get a, a total risk of failure. And then, uh, then after you have each individual risk of failure, then you can calculate the overall risk of failure for a whole fleet. Uh, more uh, showing as, a, as an equation what, what uh, risk of failure is calculated. So again, we, we look at what, is the, uh, what it was designed with, what, what, what it saw like during uh, the environment it was in, and then the present condition. And then, uh, then you calculate the overall risk of failure. Okay, now um, for, for us, uh, we, we have this uh, all in a, uh, in a, in a special tool. So uh, the, the input for our tool is all Excel-based, and then, uh, then the tool is all, uh, all done with the, all the different rules, and then it calculates all the, uh, the different risk of failures. And then, uh, then we get an output chart like this. Okay, so what, I, what I'm going to go through now is just some different examples of uh, risk of failure calculations. And then I'll go through um, what, what, uh, what things can be done to uh, reduce risk of failure or mitigate risk of failure. So this is a uh, risk of failure calculation that was done for a large hydroelectric plant. Uh, actually, uh, yesterday this was, uh, was presented uh, with, with this customer. And um, I mean, for this one, I mean, there was 30 transformers, and then the, uh, the risk of failure is calculated for, uh, for all the different transformers. And uh, you know, from this uh, fleet study, then uh, you know, a plan was developed to uh, to you know, re reduce the, the red ones and, and then eventually a long-term plan to uh, replace a lot of these assets. But, but in this case, like a, a design study was done basically of every design and uh, because it was a smaller number of transformers and uh, the, the value of the assets was high, you could do a, a very detailed uh, study was done on every particular transformer here. But that's not always the case. I mean, you, you can have a much larger fleet and then, uh, then you would maybe just focus on uh, just a, you know, 10% of the transformers in a very detailed way, and then uh, a, you know, less uh, less detailed for a larger number of the transformers. This is a, an example of a smaller fleet study for just one particular site. So in this case, I mean, there was only 11 transformers, but uh, and then uh, and this and then a risk of failure was calculated for all of them. And uh, for this one, uh, like a design study was not done. It was done more based on the, the condition of the transformers and uh, what was known about the design of the transformers. So, so just, just want to show, I mean, it can be done for a large fleet. It can be done for a smaller fleet. It can be done just for, a, uh, just for one location, the transformers at one location. Okay. So now um, typical things that can be done to, um, to reduce the risk of failure, to uh, you know, mitigate the risk of failure. So one, one thing is you know, doing diagnostic testing. So this is, um, you know, doing something more advanced than just ratio and resistance, and I'll, I'll show that. So normally that's uh, doing a frequency response analysis or um, dielectric frequency response. Uh, you can do uh, internal upgrades on a transformer. Like, say, a design study has shown that there's certain dielectric weaknesses in the transformers. I mean, in some cases, uh, you can go inside the transformer and make modifications to, uh, to take away those uh, dielectric risks. Uh, bushing replacement, as I said, uh, that, that, that can be a very good uh, way to reduce risk of failure. If you have bushings that are, have, that are known, like certain vintages of that bushing are known to uh, have a high risk of failure, or you know, if you see the uh, power factor creeping up. Uh, doing uh, upgrades in the cooling system. So this is where you, you take out the old cooling system, you put in something larger or something more effective. Uh, processing the oil. So this is um, to uh, improve the dielectric properties of the oil. And uh, I, actually, I'm going to go through all of these individually. And then doing a cooling a control system upgrade. Uh, internal inspection can be very good. I mean, this is you know, you, where you take the unit out of service, you drain the oil, and then uh, a design engineer goes inside and looks uh, for what, what, what issues can be seen. Uh, doing modifications on the conservator. Now, what we mean by that usually is... Um, is uh, you know a lot of transformers are designed to be uh, free breathing, so meaning when uh, when the the oil expands and contracts, then it's just taking air in and out from from outside. But you can change that so that it has a um, a system where it's not exchanging air with the outside. And and the good thing about that is that you then you don't get oxygen in the oil, and then it reduces the uh, the aging rate of the of the cellulose. 
and uh, doing top changer maintenance or replacement of a top changer. I mean, in some cases, uh, you you can have a top changer that is that is so old that um, it's no longer supported anymore, and it becomes more practical just to replace it with a uh, with a modern uh, modern model. Uh, another thing we see too is um, replacing the the oil with a more biodegradable uh, oil, or or totally biodegradable oil, and then uh, drying out a transformer. So this is where you remove all the moisture out of the uh, the cellulose, you know, so that uh, you first of all you reduce the aging rate, and then you can extend the life of the transformer quite a bit. So I'll just I'll just go th quickly through all these and what uh, a little more details of each. Okay, so for advanced diagnostics. Uh, I mean, you would normally do this when you think there's a problem with the transformer. Say there's gassing that's indicated there's some kind of issue with the transformer. So what, one thing that can be done, you can do like online partial discharge measurement. So this is where um, you, know, you just put acoustic equipment on the transformer and you, look, uh, you try to uh, triangulate to where there could be some issue on a transformer. Uh, you could also do uh, uh, offline partial discharge testing. So this is where you take the transformer offline and then you bring equipment in and then you, uh, you put a, uh, an over voltage on the transformer. It's usually it could be 130% of, uh, of normal rated voltage. And then you put your, your uh, partial discharge measuring equipment and then you can uh, find the issue with, uh, with the transformer. There's also SFRA and DFR, so I'll jump to these. So FRA, this is, uh, you know, this is a very popular thing, right? A popular tool right now. So what, what this is, is you, uh, you put a voltage in and you, and you measure a voltage out, but you do it across the frequency spectrum. And uh, with this, you can see if there's uh, been geometric changes in the windings. So this is very good if, um, if you think there's been some kind of fault on the transformer. You can see if there's been, uh, been changes in the, in the windings. It can also, uh, often it'll verify that nothing's happened. So I mean, this is good to know as well. Uh, now what, what this is, um, when you look at a, like this is a typical uh, FRA trace, when you just look at it, it's, it's more a comparison measurement. So usually you need to have uh, something from before, uh, you know, there was a problem. Or, the, or you can compare to a sister transformer or, the, you know, I guess the, or you could also compare phase to phase of a transformer. But again, th this can be a very good tool to uh, diagnose if there's uh, been an issue with the transformer. And uh, most, um, most new transformers are tested with FRA in the factory now. So I'd say anything you know, newer than five or six years will have an FRA done in the factory. This seems to be becoming an industry standard now. Now another diagnostic test is a dielectric frequency response. <clears throat> now this is, um, it is across a frequency spectrum, but instead of measuring the voltage with SFRA, this is measuring the power factor with SFRA or across the frequency spectrum. So this is more looking if there's been uh, changes in the dielectric uh, strength of the insulation. This is dielectric strength like of in, within the windings or from the windings to ground. So again, this is only something you would do if, if you see some kind of uh, issue with the transformer. So th this can diagnose, you know, if there's been, um, you know, like contamination into the windings or if the, uh, you know, there's been uh, carbon tracking or something like that. So. This is also another very good tool for, uh, for diagnosing a problem with a transformer. And again, an SFRA and, and DFR are very good because you don't, you know, you just need to take the transformer offline. You don't need to go inside the transformer or anything. Okay, then uh, processing of oil. I talked about that. Now, now the, I mean, when I say processing of oil, like, uh, like I don't mean just uh, degassing and dehydrating the oil. What, else, what I mean here is where you... Um, you put the uh, oil through some kind of clay system, and then you upgrade the, the properties of the oil uh, back to when it was uh, new. And uh, I mean, there's different systems for doing that. I mean, the, uh, the traditional way was using this uh, certain clay called uh, Fuller's Earth. Um, the only problem with the, the Fuller's Earth is that it's disposable, so it's uh, environmentally, it's, uh, it's not that attractive anymore. Uh, there's a lot of uh, most modern uh, ways that have a regenerative clay system. And so this can be done, uh, normally it's done offline. You de-energize the transformer and then you, you, know, you, you process the oil and you put the oil back in. It could also be done online. So uh, if, if the transformer cannot be uh, taken out of service, uh, it can be done uh, online where you take a small quantity of oil at a, at a time and then you pass it through and then you put it back in the transformer. So that, that can be done safely. But I mean, the, 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 the reason you do this is that um, you know, you can take all the sludging out of the oil and then uh, you can uh, lengthen the life of the, uh, the cellulose. 
And to just give you some idea what the oil looks like, like brand new oil is actually um, is transparent. It almost looks like water, actually. And then as, as oil ages, either because of uh, thermal aging of the oil or because of uh, sludges coming out of the windings and that, then it, it starts to become a lot, uh, a lot browner. And uh, very aged oil is, uh, is, is almost like a, the color of syrup. So uh, after you uh, process the oil, it, it comes back to a, a clear, uh, looking clear. So th this is something you might contemplate doing, you know, a, a midlife of, uh, of a transformer when it's, say, you know, 25 or 30 years old. And as I was saying, I mean, there's, um, there's things, uh, sometimes there's things you can do inside a transformer to reduce the dielectric risk of failure. This is uh, an example. Um, this, uh, lead, uh, this, is, this is a lead coming out of the winding. It's a little hard to see here in the picture, but... Um, so this is a lead coming out of the winding, and there was a lot of serious overheating on, on this winding exit lead. Otherwise, the, the, the transformer was fine. This was only the one, one part of it that uh, had, uh, it was calculated to show that it had uh, very high uh, temperatures here. So then uh, going inside the transformer, this was all, uh, you know, everything was untaped, and then it was taped with a high temperature tape. And then, you know, then you took away that dielect, that, uh, that thermal risk, actually. So again, this is just an example of, uh, of, of things that can be done inside a transformer. I mean, other typical things, you know, are adding uh, barriers between windings or add barriers uh, around leads. Uh, modifying the, um, the clamping system, so, or uh, securing leads uh, better. So you, you can do a lot in, uh, inside a transformer without, you know, without taking it to a repair factory. Yeah, and this is just another example of a transformer. I mean, this is the one that had a uh, very high uh, winding resistance, and it actually had also, you could see something in the DGA. So uh, internal inspection was done, and then, you know, and then it found uh, it was actually an issue with the lead where a uh, crimp was, uh, was becoming loose inside of a lead. So by, uh, you know, untaping that and cleaning everything up, you know, you, you took away uh, that, that risk. This is actually supposed to be a three cable. This was a cutaway view of the crimp. There's supposed to be three cables coming through here. But you can see that the crimp was done such that it actually only ended up with one cable being going through there, one of the three. So this overheated uh, like seriously over time. And uh, eventually that would have just burned up and then uh, you could have had a, a very bad dielectric failure then. This is an example of a, of a cooling upgrade. So where um, in this case um, the, the old fans were taken away and um, higher speed, uh, higher capability fans were put on. And in this way, you could uh, reduce the, uh, the oil temperatures. In this case, the, uh, this, this customer wanted to uh, increase the capacity of the transformer, but you could also do this, you know, just to lower, lower oil temperatures so that you can reduce the cellulose aging. So this is a you know, fairly inexpensive uh, option. And then I, I talked about internal inspections. Uh, again, this is, uh, this is very good if you have, uh, have some kind of uh, gassing in a transformer. You can uh, often find what, what is the problem and then uh, do fixes on it. Okay. And then uh, for drying a transformer, okay, so uh, as, as um, a transformer ages, you know, you can, you'll get moisture inside the transformer, either through you know, leaks and then it's thermally expanding and contracting. You can also get uh, moisture just because of the aging of the cellulose. When cellulose ages, one of the byproducts is moisture. And then, uh, but the problem is that moisture accelerates the aging of, uh, of cellulose. So it's kind of a, a vicious circle. So, once, uh, once you see inside the transformer that you, the moisture level is creeping up, uh, a very good thing that can be done is to dry out that, that transformer. You know, so again, this is something you might contemplate doing a midlife of a transformer. And uh, by, again, by drying out the transformer, you reduce the aging rate, and then you can also reduce uh, dielectric risk. If, if the, the moisture becomes so much, then you can, you, you can reach a point where you compromise the, uh, the cellulose oil insulation structure of the transformer. And uh, that, that can in increase that risk of failure. So there's, there's different ways of drying out a transformer. The, um, the one way, uh, or the traditional way, is using, uh, you know, you drain it and then you do a hot oil vacuum system. Uh, there's another, uh, we, we think is a better way, is using uh, low frequency heating. So where you put uh, a current on the windings. And uh, you put a current that is a low frequency. And by doing it at a low frequency, then you don't have any uh, leakage flux in the windings. And because of that, then, you don't have, a, like, a hot spot in the winding. So basically, you can have the same temperature across the whole winding as you're, as you're doing this heating. And you can do this at, at pretty high temperatures, like up to about 110, 115 degrees. And you can uh, really effectively dry out a transformer in the field. 
Uh, just as a comparison, if you did hot oil vacuum, usually the best you can achieve is about 75, 80 degrees. So, uh, and temperature is everything when you're drying out a transformer. Uh, so with, with doing uh, this type of system, you know, you can, um, you can uh, reduce your uh, percent moisture down to, you know, 0 0.7, 0.8 percent uh, of, of the uh, of moisture in the cellulose. Okay, thank you very much.